one of the most effective things you can modify that will almost instantly help you build strength, build muscle, burn body fat, reduce cravings, improve your mood, and balance out your hormones is optimize your sleep. Literally, if you optimize your sleep, you can dramatically improve all of the things I mentioned and a lot more. Um, this, this right here, I wish I knew. I feel personally attacked. When right I was now. younger, I know. <laughs> I feel like we sleep in your did bed. You do this because I said that to you this morning, or no, why you came no. up with this? <laughs> no, holy cow, that's true. How huh? you did come <laughs> yeah, in this morning? I just came in and say that. Like, God damn it. Well, I got little ones too, man. So it's like this is a thing. You know what the issue is with this? Um, is that, and this is true for a lot of different things, is that people don't. Most of us, including me, I didn't understand this as well for a lot of things. Don't understand the difference between essential and optimal. There's a wide gap between essential and optimal. Most people, we survive off of essential sleep. Like we know when you're not getting essential sleep because you're literally, you can't think straight. You're like, wow, something's really wrong with me. Usually when you have a newborn, that's when you start to go below essential sleep and you know like, oh my God, this is like torture. Delirious. Yeah. Delirious. But beyond that, most people are like, I get enough sleep because we're getting essential sleep. Like you're not, you're not getting... You're not getting so little sleep that you notice these massive detriments in your personality, mood, day, and you know, horrible health. Uh, you, if you do, you, you have insomnia. You probably are. Going I feel to like doctor. it's real similar to how people look at it like uh, or how they uh, look at protein. Every, oh, totally. Right. Like, every, every, like everybody thinks like almost every client thinks like, oh yeah, yeah, I eat protein because they eat meat or something like that. Yeah. And it's like, and then they track. And it's like, okay, well, yeah, we're not in the range that you're going to die from right. not eating enough protein. But boy, there's a, a much greater range that you could be towards the top of to get maximal results in everything that you're doing. I feel the same way about sleep. People sleep and they're like, oh, I'm fine. Yeah. I get up, I do my thing, because but they're running off of four or five hours or interrupted sleep for seven or eight <clears throat> hours. And it's like, boy, well, there's still so much more potential. That's more common. It's more common that people get <clears throat> the seven to eight hour block because they know that they're supposed to get seven to eight hours, but it's bad quality uh, seven to eight hours. So really it's equivalent to like five and a half or six hours of sleep because it's quality and quantity. But you're right, Adam, this is true for like water. Water's another one, right? I had this conversation with my oldest where he's like, I'm like, you need to drink more water. He's like, I drink when I'm thirsty. My body tells me I not water. I said, yeah, your body tells you when you need essential water. Yeah. But optimal water intake makes a big difference. Well, you know, the actually what they say about that is by the time you are thirsty, like the the process of like dehydration has already started, correct? Is that right? Yeah, somewhat, right? You're getting there, right? So yeah. once you're thirsty, it's like you're starting to get to the point where uh, it's basically like get water right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah like yeah. if you if you wait till you're thirsty, that means you didn't get enough. Well, the idea is to be drinking consistently enough to where you never feel that kind of thirst. Right. right? Now, when it comes to sleep and muscle gain, fat <laughs> loss, health, performance, and all that stuff, the re it's not that sleep is this magic uh, anabolic factor, but rather when you lack sleep, it has profound negative effects. Yeah. So when you correct it, it feels like the craziest, most amazing thing uh, you've ever done in your entire life. Like literally, this is no exaggeration. When I figured this out as a trainer way later, it took me like, I don't know, it took me like 15 years, literally 15 years to figure out. I didn't look at sleep at all with my clients uh, for 15 years. But when I started focusing on this, I would see, I would have a client, we just like, and we would pick one thing to focus on at a time, right? So let's say it was sleep and I'm like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to optimize your sleep. And I would look at things like temperature of the room, you know, light within the room, things that you do before going to bed, you know, yada, yada, all the things we've talked about. And then when they would start to dial it in, it would literally be like an instant four pounds of muscle gain, like right away, like all of a sudden doing the same stuff, yeah. they gain four pounds of muscle or that stubborn five pounds of body fat would go away or the, you know, anxiety that they had on and off all of a sudden uh, disappeared. Right. And it's, again, it's not that the sleep is magic. It's rather that the not optimal amounts of sleep has profound effects. Well, you got to think that, okay, it, if you don't get optimal sleep, it's going to affect somewhat of the recovery process. If you don't get optimal sleep, then it's going to affect somewhat your energy level the next day. If you don't get optimal sleep, you're, it's going to somewhat affect your probably your eating habits and nutrition. Your I mean, hormones, I, your catecholamines, your neurotransmitters. And, and all those things play a role in your body deciding whether it's going to build muscle from the stimulus that you probably are going to do inside the gym. And so, I mean, I it's... 
it's hard to like measure something like this, but I've, I've done this for long enough, consistently <laughs> enough that it's very clear to me when, when sleep is aligned and I'm getting good quality sleep consistently, my body responds. Like when I'm training and I'm eating right, I see the difference and changing when I'm not, or it's inconsistent. I feel like the results are inconsistent. I feel like I'm still eating good. I'm still training. I'm still doing those things, but then the results aren't coming on the same way they are when I'm getting optimal sleep. hundred percent. And, uh, I, this is how I've heard it explained by, uh, evolutionary scientists and it makes perfect sense. Right. So Obviously, the way evolution works is bad traits uh, tend to disappear or traits that tend to be detrimental to the survival of species get, you know, evolved away or bred away. Traits that are positive tend to get amplified. And so over time, you know, the, the species becomes more resilient to its environment and, and all that stuff. Sleep, for all intents and purposes, is terrible. You literally are unconscious. You're you don't know what's going around. You're not awake to produce. You're not awake to get food. You're not awake to build. You're not awake to do anything. And you're unconscious. And you're literally food laying there on the floor. And animals can come eat you. So the way that they explained it was: here's how important sleep is. It's so important that we didn't evolve it away. In fact, almost every animal we know goes through a period of sleep. That's how profoundly important this is. So someone watching this might be like, oh, I'm getting, you know, good gains. You know, I eat right. I, I exercise consistently. You know, I, I have a good lifestyle. I seem to be pretty fit or whatever. You have no idea how big of an impact optimizing your sleep can have on all those things. It's almost like night and day difference. And I've seen this with young people, definitely with old people. It's just one of those things that makes a profound difference. And we invest so much time and money and energy in our workouts and our diet and our supplements that we completely take for granted the the power, the impact that sleep can have on us. You know what I was thinking is, as we're kind of talking about this is, uh, you know, how we look at nutrition and how um, if you go through a fast, like what, how enlightened you get in terms of your behaviors um, and what... What sort of things like revolve around your schedule of food and like, you know, when you tend to eat certain types of foods and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, if we put that kind of attention towards sleep and we really kind of peered into that, I know there's some tracking devices at this point now where you can kind of see like REM sleep. You can see kind of that deeper sleep uh, and get some little bit of insight there uh, and, and really like pay that kind of like disciplined attention to it in order to optimize. I think the only time most people really uh, feel that that real great deep sleep is like if they're on vacation yeah. and, and they don't even realize that yeah. like they think it's the vacation that's doing all of the work when in fact it's probably sleep and sun is like the most you know optimal thing that they're feeling yeah that's you're 100 percent right and um you know it's uh again it's extremely impactful on the body and you know something to consider is that our environment rapidly changed because we innovated. And what I mean by rapidly is if you look at a uh, you know, big scale, how long modern humans have been on earth, for most, for the vast, like 99.9% .9 of the time that modern humans, like my physical body. Yeah, like, like the last 75 years, it's like we've totally- Environment completely changed. Like, shifted. You now have to schedule activity <clears throat> because our lives are completely inactive. Never in human history have you had to like purposely lift heavy things. We never get in, a, in an environment <laughs> no. that moves anywhere from 65 to 80, right? We like constantly keep ourselves in this like controlled temperature environment. Totally. <laughs> we, we food, we have to, we have to actually discipline ourselves to not overeat. Like, could you imagine going back if for most of human history and telling people, oh, you know, in the future, people actually die from too much food. They would look at you like you're crazy. They would laugh. Like, what are yeah. you talking about? That's insane, right? I can string almost a week together and not see the sun. I yeah. mean, you get up early enough and go to a job where you you know, are under fluorescent lights and work there till late late hours. You may not see the sun for a week. That's, that's crazy. That's right. Now, yeah. sleep, like if you look at the most of, for most of human history, first off, we're terrible at night. In the dark, we're essentially blind and we're not very, I mean, imagine being in the woods in the dark so you don't have an electric lights. Maybe, a, you know, you have like a torch, right? A flame or whatever. Like you're like sitting prey. Like you're literally uh, a cheeseburger walking around in a dark room and everything yeah. around you wants to eat you. So we, we evolved to move around when the sun was out and to hide when the sun went down. So what does that mean? It means that we sleep best when it's dark. We sleep best when the, the light starts to slowly dim. Doesn't just shut off. The sun's never done that where it's like, oh, it's bright. Now it's completely dark. Doesn't work that way. It's like slowly... 
becomes dark, and the temperature cools down. Mm. So optimal sleep temperature is a lot cooler than what we would consider to be optimal temperature to like hang out. You know, most people like 72 degrees, 73 degrees in the house. Yeah. Optimal sleep is like in the 60s. Yeah. And that's because, uh, you know, it would cool down at night, uh, warm up as the sun went up. So, you know, those are a few things you can focus on. And like, for example, we work with a company called Sleep Me. And this is a device that sits on your bed. It uses water to optimize the temperature of the bed. Now, there's individual variants here. So I gave you the general number. It's like in the 60s, I think high, mid to high 60s of temperature for optimal sleep. But, you know, everybody's a little different, right? When you optimize temperature and you do nothing else, nothing else, you just optimize temperature, you see profound impacts on sleep quality. So even if you don't do the thing with light, even if you don't do the thing with diet and stress and caffeine, you do nothing else. All you do is make sure that your room or your bed is optimal temperature for you. Then you'll see profound impacts in sleep quality. And then downstream, you'll see improvements in hormone profile, cravings, <coughs> muscle gain, recovery, like all the stuff Energy, that works. Yeah. And it's such an easy thing. And I like, I like, and I know you guys are like this too, as coaches and trainers, there's all this list of things that we can do to improve someone's health and fitness. But the way we prioritize them is what's the easiest and, yeah. the, mo and the most easiest impactful. or cheapest, right? Yeah. Like what's the easiest, but also has the most impact. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's like, oh, you know, you can burn more body fat by, you know, swimming in a cold lake at 4 a.m. Like I'm never going to tell a client <laughs> to do that because no one's going to do that. Yeah. But if it's like, hey, put this on your bed, t set the temperature. And you're going to have profound impacts and in never, sleep. And you never have to touch it again. You don't got to yeah. change Turn, anything turns else. Turns on by itself. It's also, it's been one of the the best things that I ever invested in. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a quite the investment the first time you buy it, but then you never have to do anything to it. Mm -hmm. And I'm terrible with like, you, you brought up the supplements and stuff because I understand, I know how much that moves the needle. Yeah. And so that's part, it plays into my behaviors around it. It's like, oh yeah, I should take this. I need to take this. Yeah. And it's like, eh, whatever. Or something like that, I can set it, leave it. And I have already had so many nights where I know like, man, if I didn't have that, totally. it would have been a miserable night of sleep. Well, it's funny. It reminds me a, a long time ago, you brought up like where you invest and in, where you're spending most of your time and it's your car it's your it's your bed yeah. it's, you know it's these places and like your bed especially because you know if you invest and you have a good mattress you have you know temperature controlled all these things like just think about what a better human you are when you wake up and like you're in a better mood you're, you're more vibrant you have all these things going for you so it's like why not like invest in that direction it just makes too much sense to me yeah so. it's like a simple uh you you know, it's funny how we value things, right? Um, I mean, how many times have you guys talked to clients about like the price of a gym membership? Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, you know, back, back, by the way, back in the day, gyms were more expensive than they are now. So when I first managed gyms in the late 90s, if you wanted a membership at a Globo gym, right, uh, it was like 40 to 50 bucks a month, which now is considered super expensive. Yeah, plus like a 300 something enrollment. Yeah, that's back then. Okay, so now they're like 20 bucks a month or whatever, but I'm sure people still do this, right? So I would present someone a membership. And they'd be like, 40 bucks a month. Oh my God, that's really, that's crazy expensive. <laughs> and and you would, and but now as someone who understands the impact of fitness and also understands how much they spend on eating out, uh, entertainment, you know, uh, chips, you know, like, like silly stuff, right? That adds up to hundreds of dollars a month. Now people spend hundreds of dollars a month on their cell phone or whatever. And now you can get a gym membership for 20 bucks. If you use it, like there's, there's nothing that in terms of cost versus value, and sleep is one of those things. So you can invest in something that will improve the quality of your sleep. Uh, I can't think of a single thing aside from hiring a trainer or a coach. I think that's the most valuable thing you can invest in. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything else more valuable where you'll get more of a return on your money than just improving your sleep. There's nothing nothing like it. You know, it doesn't yeah. even come close. So, What's up, everybody? Today's giveaway program is MAPS Strong. Here's how you can win that program. You want to leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we post it, subscribe to this channel, and turn on notifications. Do all those things, and if you win, we'll let you know in the comment section that you won MAPS Strong. We're also running a sale right now, okay? MAPS Anabolic is 50% off, and MAPS Split is 50% off. So they're both half off only this month. If you're interested, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Anyway, speaking of moods and stuff like that, uh, 
Justin, I want to ask you what happened this morning. You came in so <laughs> so, pick so on angry. Dude. Fuck, dude. I'm, I'm like angsty this morning, dude. Uh, what I got a little bit of chip bro? on my shoulder, dude. I I don't know. Like I didn't I woke up and it was just one of those things where you just have kind of like a few things that are off and uh and you try to ignore it. You're like, nah, I'm just yeah, you know, it's fine. I'll I'll get through this. And like um so I just didn't have like laundry i didn't have like i had to like help uh the kids like find things and we couldn't find it and you know and it's so it was just kind of like a domino effect thing and i'm like on the road like just rushing to get in because I, I felt like now all of a sudden i'm late and i have my coffee in the car with me and um i'm driving over the hill and <laughs> it's just i think when you're in a certain energy, it's just, it attracts all this kind of shit that just like kind of finds you. Yeah, They're like, Ooh. So I had people cut me off. I had like all this kind of like energy just surrounding me and my, and, and I was like texting somebody, which I, I don't typically try to do, but somebody's like texting me and I'm like, Oh, you know, reading it and rise I'm reading it. Somebody slams on their brakes in front of me. And I'm like, ah, and my coffee, it's, it's one of those, um, thermoses that just didn't fit in the console at all like so it's so just it's like a wide it was a wide base to it and it and so you like your cups i, like I kind of could right? fit it in there but it didn't like secure it in there and and the cup had like the top lid too i had it thankfully uh but but it was open because i was taking a sip and so like i slam brakes boom it comes back and just spills everywhere in, in the center console like all over the place and it was like i was already like midway in so i couldn't really pull over Got and like clean it up too. i'm like sitting there you know when you have to like just stare at a stain <laughs> and it's just looking at you the whole rest of the time i'm like driving over the hill and i'm just like Ugh. and it was like you know this is the car i care about you yeah. know it wasn't even the other one that's like yeah. you know i'm like doing like the dump runs with and shit yeah. and like you know so uh, yeah I'm, I'm feeling a little I've Ang no, angsty right I've now. worked with you guys long enough to know your uh, like to feel your moods. Oh god, and, the way someone walks in, and yeah, it. Justin's got this look on his face because he's not like <laughs> hyper expressive. It's not like he comes in, he's like, "I'm mad." He just has this, <laughs> he just has this look on his face, and you know, like, oh, there's there's a there's a little bit of a there's a volcano under that. Let's just chill here for a second. So he came in, and I was like, "What happened, bro?" Yeah. What yeah. is it about coffee? I don't know. And protein drinks. Th those are the two things. I could spill anything and it annoys the shit out of me. Yeah. But coffee and and protein shakes. I, I make me so mad. You just know it's going to stay. You know, like there's just like a little bit of like a smell and there's a little bit of a stick. You're like, this is going to stay a little bit. Like, well, at least you're wearing like out. good. Because here's, yeah, I, I have this, I have good. this weird habit of. I rarely ever spill coffee, but if I do, it's a white t-shirt day. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's never a camo and black day. I mean, that's cool. Yeah, it's I at least <laughs> got that. Yeah, so it kind of <laughs> blends in. Yeah, yeah. So you can't yeah. Tell. It's always like a white outfit or khaki pants or something like that, and I spill coffee. It's I the think, only time I spill I coffee. I think what it is for me yeah. is that when I'm getting coffee, it's my caffeine fix. So I'm, not, I'm looking forward to it more than like a regular drink. So not only am I mad that I spilled it, oh, now yeah. I don't get my damn caffeine. Yeah, and I needed that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then with protein, it's the same thing. Like, oh, here's my 40 grams of protein. I need this or whatever. I remember yeah. one time I was in the car and I was in the back seat because we were going with my parents and I must have been 16 years old or something like that. And this was back when, you know, I thought if I didn't have protein every other hour, I would drink. <laughs> You're going to lose muscle. Bro, so <laughs> yeah. I can so just, just see you frantic. So, so I'm a 16-year-old kid, and we're on our way to like a communion. So I'm wearing like a suit with a tie. And I got my shaker cup ready and a little baggie with my protein powder. And I'm watching the clock. Oh, it's time for my protein. So I pour it in there, and I shake it. You ever do this with a shaker cup? And the top oh, pops. Oh, it's all the way on. Bro. Uh, yeah. It just, it just, poof, yeah. Protein, <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> Everywhere, everywhere, all yeah. over my shirt. That's the worst. Or when you furious, like, you have so many protein cups that the wrong lid is on. Oh, and then just little yeah, you go to shake out. and it just squirts all over the place, oh. and it's all over your counter and floor. It makes me oh. want to kill somebody <laughs> yeah. when I do something like that. Yeah. Oh, it's so annoying. I can't so, stand it. You know, it's funny. I was uh, speaking of feelings and stuff. I heard every once in a while, um, I'll hear something that just clicks, and it's not like I didn't know this, but it clicked so uh, it was like really profound when I heard it. And it was, I keep talking about this. I have, there's no affiliation. Okay. So I have no affiliation to this, but it's such a great course. It's the good inside course. Dr. Becky teaches it, I'm trying to get her on the show. She's, I think she's brilliant. And it, you know, I'm learning about like kids, toddlers and little kids and all that stuff. And she said something on that. that was so, uh, just it's so impactful. 
she said something along the lines of, you can't, like, stop trying to control your feelings. You're going to have them. You can't stop them. They're there. It's the relationship to those feelings that you can work on. So it's not the feeling. Everybody has anxiety, anger, stress, sadness. All of us experience that. It's the relationship to those feelings that you can work on and manage and right, change. Right. I.e. how we react to those. How we feelings. react, how it feels to like, and if you think about our experience, like as, as humans, um, the, the, the physiological, you know, effects of feelings or pain or hot or cold or whatever, that's pretty consistent. Maybe some variants, but we're, we're so consistent that all of us could go to the doctor and the doctor could treat all of us. And for the most part, you know, figure out what's going on. Right. So that's pretty consistent. The gap though, between that and our relationship to those feelings is so vast. Like you take somebody who grows up, uh, living in the cold mountains and, you know, they grow up with hard labor, their relationship to like cold and struggle and pain is very different than somebody who grew up in a very comfortable, you know, type environment. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, I mean, I, my, my family, they're all hard labor and you know, the way my dad grew up, like he definitely has a different relationship to being uncomfortable in that way than I do just through practice. So I thought it was a pretty cool thing. I've been thinking a lot about that, like our relationship to those feelings and, um, you know, and all those things. So I don't know. Pretty, I, I mean, I think it's, that speaks a lot to, um, parenting. It speaks a lot to the environment. I think that Katrina and I have worked really hard to try and create in our house. We recognize that our son's going to go through phases and times where he's going to be moody or he's going to change the way he likes or not likes things, or he's not going to want to do stuff exactly the way we consistently do some days. And the one thing that we've been really good about is we always remain consistent, no matter how inconsistent he is about those certain things is that we, and, and we don't, I think sometimes as parents, we tend to uh, overreact on things. And when you really pull yourself out, that's why I like that. Uh, the, the girl that you're referring to, because uh, I watched the video that you shared. It's like, you know, when you pull yourself away from the situation, like when you're in it, it's so hard to see this, but when you can actually separate for a minute and go like, okay, is it that big of a deal? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it that big of it? Like, is the end of the world if, you know, it's 15 more minutes till he gets into his bath or he doesn't completely finish his, his plate or he skips that food or it's like, or he doesn't want to put on those pants. It's just like, you know, when we really think about and it's always, it all ha tends to happen to parents when we're, you know, we're in a hurry to do something or we're, or multitasking and we're trying to fix something out. Or you're and, just stressed out yourself. Yeah. Or maybe you got something else going on your, yeah. and that happens. And so, you know, and how we react. And I guess, uh, you know, I think a lot of this has to do with probably how both Katrina and I were raised. We both were raised in very volatile type of homes. And we know how much we were impacted as children from that, that inconsistency. And so her and I, it's so great to have a partner who that is as important to me as it is her. And so in those moments, like we just don't let it, we don't ever let it get to us and us react in front of him. And I think that because she gets, sometimes she gets mad at me. I talk about on the show, you guys have heard me say this. I should clear this up while I'm addressing this right now about like what my son is just seems he's he's a great kid he's easy and she's like hey you know when you talk about that all the time it's like you really don't give us credit for what we do <laughs> and she's like you make it sound like we just got lucky we got this yeah. easy ass kid and we don't actually you don't put, have to parent yeah like we don't have to parent or anything like that we didn't actually we don't put a conscious effort towards this and she's right like and, and sometimes it feels effortless because we've been so consistent with that for so long and i and i see it pay us back on the way he reacts and his behavior. You know, it's a good example. This is an easy, simple example. I think you guys will all relate to. You know, when your kid is little <clears throat> and they fall down, and mm -hmm. you'll ha either you'll have the parent that's like, "Oh my god," and they rush over, and then the kid. I mean, nothing happened. They just fell. Yeah. And then the kid all of a sudden, oh, and then they start crying and freaking out. Versus they fell. Mm -hmm. You stay calm, see what happened, walk over, and nine out of ten times. They get up and there's there's not a big deal. Like that's you, a good example. Well, yeah, and yeah. you from the very beginning train that his response. Totally. I mean, we, we to that exact point, uh, we did that with the way he throws it when he threw up. Like your kid's gonna get sick. <laughs> like every parent is gonna have. Yes. Your child is gonna uncontrollably vomit all over you and stuff at one point of parenting. Terrible truth. <laughs> and when yeah. that happens, like if you just if you take it on the chin and can actually remain calm, especially the first few times that happens. 
Like when Max throws up, like he throws up and then he's like, oh, he's apologizing or he's like, he he's just not wipes, freaking out. He just wipes his chin. He doesn't cry. Like it's just he we reacted that way. And I see now the the benefits of that as that's happened so many more times later on. Yeah, right? it's so cool. So last night, something uh, something happened along these lines. And I think this is actually a dad, a mom, dad thing, because I was like this with my older kids when they were little as well. Um, and that, so Aurelius is, he's, you know, he's two and a half and kids go through these stages where they'll, they'll just be scared. They'll start to be scared of the dark or they'll wake up in the middle of night and they'll be a little afraid, you know, the whole like monster in the closet or what's that noise type of thing. Super common. And if that happens and he wakes up and he's anxious, if I go in there, I can very easily make him feel calm relaxed. He goes to sleep. Jessica has more of a challenge doing this. Now there's other things that are the reverse, but in this particular case, you know, I'll go in there and you'll feel calm and whatever. And I was thinking about this. I'm like, I don't really say anything that's like magical. There's no like special thing I do. And I'm like, you know what it is, is that dad seems like uh secure, you know, strong, like, well, now I'm not scared because dad's here. So instantly Mm -hmm. His fear goes down. I heard this one um, woman talking about this, this lawyer who defended fathers in custody um, situations. Like there's, if you look at like custody moms versus dads, the dads usually lose. And uh, there's questions that they'll ask the fathers when these cases get really nasty that the, this particular lawyer says is not fair. And they'll use these questions to make it look like the dad doesn't know what the hell's going on. So they'll say something like, Okay, you know, what's Mr. his favorite food? Or no, something. It says, okay, Mr. Smith, <laughs> you're such a good dad. What's the name of the of his pediatrician? Sure, yeah, yeah. What's the phone number to the doctor? Yeah. You know, who's the third grade teacher? That whatever. Yeah. And yeah, the dad's all, like, all things I would fail my wife. Yeah, and the dad's like, I don't know, I don't know. So this lawyer, she yeah. came out and she said, "You're asking the dad the wrong questions. Ask him what's your what's your child scared of in the middle of the night? Mm -hmm. What gets them the most excited? Like stuff like that. Yeah, things yeah. that dads tend to be." So the whole fear thing, I think, is a big one where kids just kind of feel, you know, like, oh, yeah. dad's here. Safety. I feel a little safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well, remember when we, uh, we, I told you when we first, when we first, first started, it, we first had Max, um, that I believe that when they can't speak, they can't, the other senses are heightened. Yeah. Like they can read energy and feel that at like such a, a higher level. I think you put that off, right? Totally. You, you're this, this big, imposing, confident, strong man. And then I think your son has to feel, and daughter have to feel that. Even the way you care, the way you carry your kid is different than the way your mom carried. Mm -hmm. Like Katrina has this much gentler approach the way and <laughs> she coddles and holds him. I can hold him and like pick heavy things up and push stuff out of the way while I'm grabbing him, move through crowds and stuff like that. And I think he just feels that. I remember when we went through that phase where we would go to anywhere public and, and if it's loud and, and crazy, like my son is just not a fan of that. And he instantly comes to me. doesn't come to mom where in other situations, he goes to her first. Always mm -hmm. like if, if he's sick, you better believe he's going straight to, to, to mom. If he comes in in the middle of the night and he's half awake and he wants to cuddle, he goes straight to mom. He's not coming to me, but if he's in an environment where he's scared or he has a bad dream or like that, I can walk in, calm him down in a few minutes and walk right yeah. out. Where if Katrina goes in there, she's got to lay in there with him and stay in there all yes, night. Yes, that's what'll happen. I feel like I can come in and she's always just like, I don't get it. Like you don't do anything. You just sit in there. <laughs> like you, I don't even have to, I just touch him for a minute, calm him down. And then I'm sitting at the edge of the bed, letting him relax. And then I can even lean over after about uh, five minutes of being in there, kiss him, say, okay, dad has to go to bed. And he, okay. He's chill. And he's chill. He's I up. literally, I mm -hmm. went in there yeah. and I, I rubbed, I said, are you, are you scared, buddy? And he goes, okay. He says, okay. Instead of yes. He's like, okay. And I'm like, yeah. I said, listen, I'm here. Nothing's going to bother you. And yeah. then I'm like rubbing his back and I'm like, Hey, you know what we're going to do tomorrow? Start talking about tomorrow. What's going to happen. His cousins are coming over. He starts giggling. All right, buddy, you need to go to sleep. I want to see mama. Mama's in bed, but don't worry. I, I'll hear you on the monitor. If, if, if you need me, you just let me know. Okay. Rub his back, goes to sleep. If yeah. she goes in there, She'll have to literally sleep on the floor yeah. sometimes. Yeah, well, that's what happens to yeah. Katrina. A lot that if there's a night where Katrina doesn't come in our bed, that's because she went in to do that and couldn't, and, come, back. And couldn't come back because he would. Now on the on the flip side, uh, my older kids who aren't even Jessica's biological children, <laughs> so they're her stepkids. When it's something that they want to talk about, that's kind of challenging, that they feel like they may get judged on, or they want to be understood, they will tell her before they tell me or their mom, mm. and it's because she's really good at like. She doesn't react to like 
stuff like that. Like, oh, you know, I went to this party and then these kids were doing drugs or whatever. And they could feel my reaction when I said, and Jessica's like, they could tell her anything and she's super chill about it. So they'll go to her for it. So thank God I have her because otherwise my kids probably. No, Justin, I always like asking you because you have two boys and they're both like, I feel like one's Courtney, one's you. And do you have that same, that same experience with both of them or is it different for each of them? Like in that situation, like we're we calming them down if they're scared. It's like, does one son kind of tend to go to Courtney because of those things? And then one tends to go to you or do you consistently see that behavior with them? Yeah, I think commonly like to what you guys are talking about, I'll pretty much have, it's a lot easier for me to go in and calm them down and, and, you know, be that kind of presence for them, especially if there's anything they're scared about, like I'll go in and it's, it, it is the same thing. Like I'll just kind of hang out for a bit and then, um, they'll, they'll feel like it rests. And then, but when, when Courtney's in there, she does have to stay in there quite a long time. I think, um, in terms of what they want to share with me, it's a little different. So mm-hmm. like Courtney has a little bit of different relationship with, with Ethan and, uh, Everett, like it, we both kind of have a little bit of a different um, relationship, which is interesting. It's not like any better or worse. It's just like, I feel like well, there they, was, there's just a different bond between. Yeah, the they two. relate different. I feel like Everett totally yeah. is a mini you. I feel like Courtney and, and uh, Ethan are very similar. And so I imagine when they have something like bothering them inside, they're going to go to the parent that they're, they probably identify emotionally with. I mean, would you yeah. say that? Yeah. I would, yeah. Like, so I told you guys a long time ago, like I was trying to have like the sex talk and I was trying to kind of like, you know, with drugs and, and all that kind of stuff with, with Ethan. And and so it's interesting because he'll listen and he'll contribute, but he doesn't contribute very much. And he, he tells Courtney like everything. And it's like, it's, it, it's just, I don't know. Did it it's bother weird you? to me. It kind Did, of bothers me a yeah. little bit. Does but it still, or are you still, are no, you like, I oh. mean, I, I'm totally fine with that. Like, I understand like it's, um, they've kind of been like that forever like he's just been very open and honest with her about like just everything and i'm like oh keep that you know like i so i don't want to get in in the way of that because it's an open channel that that totally it can relay and then i can kind of come in too and like and he's not opposed to talk he's just like he gets uncomfortable talking about it with me for some right, reason, right. which i'm like you know i kind of wrestle with that a little bit i'm like try to be you know try different angles and, and different approaches with it. But it's, it's, it's mainly really, just like a, a bonding thing. I think from a person out knowing you guys really well and the a person out, outside looking in, I just, I think it's a Courtney or Ethan is Courtney emotionally. Everett is you emotionally. And those are like yeah. emotional things. Yeah. And so just the way he feels his feelings mm-hmm. is more like his mom. Yeah. And so and when it comes to those types of stuff, he probably, gra- and, and I think you're going to get that with Everett. Everett is so you, the way he reacts and responds to things. So when yeah. those conversations come for him, I feel like he's going to gravitate towards you. I just, it is. Yeah. It's very, it's funny. Cause Everett is very, um, similar. In- <laughs> bro, he's, he's a clone. On. He's, he's so- on to you. Bro. If you shrunk, <laughs> if you shrunk Justin down, that would be he's a mini me dude it's 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 almost like painful to watch sometimes but it's it i love (laughs) it at the same time because i know how to navigate with him too and that's that's because you understand yeah i understand what he's going through i understand like these uh like frustrations he has and and also like how sometimes he doesn't have the words for it and it's like and then i can kind of help him find it and it's like like i i could kind of get peer into his way of thinking a lot easier than, than Ethan. And so, yeah, it, it, it is do that you, bit. Do you recall the last, uh, like, big reflection moment for yourself through him? Meaning the last thing that you saw, like, either him really struggling with or frustrated with or even over excited about something, and he went, oh, my God, this is so – me. This is me. And then you felt like you yeah. took a leap in personal growth because of seeing – yourself and him can you recall the last i know that's happened to you yeah no it's happened a bunch of times um i mean i i'll have to kind of rack my brain about specific ones but i know one in particular when um we're talking about school and i'm uh, this has always been a challenge for me because like that whole um structure is is never really jived with me like even going through and i i was like adamant about doing well and it would piss me off that like it just was so hard for me mm. and and like I, I i was so uh had such a chip on my shoulder and like 
I didn't even want to go to college, but I just did it because I was just like, fuck. Yeah, in spite of your parents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get it. Um, and um, he is like so Ethan it's really easy like he he can like memorize and he can kind of like play the game in terms of like um studying just enough and then he just crushes you know yeah. in terms of like test taking and all that kind of stuff like Everett uh he does really well but like he has to put the work in like he and he gets pissed when like he isn't good at so math in particular is one thing that like we were kind of like working through that and like just that it wasn't it wasn't clicking and he just like gets the paper and just shreds it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, dude, and I'm laughing, you know, yeah. like Courtney is getting frustrated, like you can't. I'm like, just let just let him have his moment, because like, <laughs> that's you. Dude. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was like, he's just like he's frustrated. He, he's not getting it. You know, I think he just needs some time to like you know have all this kind of settle down and come back to earth, and then it's like it'll click eventually. Uh, but like, don't hammer him in in a state like this. You know, yeah, like yeah. don't don't press him anymore. Like he's already here. Yeah. You know, <laughs> he just shreds it, his homework, and I'm like, dude, and I'm like, we'll tell the teacher, we'll email. We'll tell your teacher the you dog know, eats like, your homework. He shredded his homework. Like, can I get a new one? You know, like that kind of a thing. You know, and I'm just like, oh no, like I yeah. I could totally see myself doing that, and I have done stuff like that where I just I'm like fuck that. You know, just but. It, it all comes back and, and, and once I'm chill, it's, it, you know, work through. I, I, man, I hope I, I'm, I see this on the horizon, but speaking about school, I hope that it continues to evolve and change because it is not uh, great for a lot of people. I know a lot of extremely intelligent, successful adults we where know, they we, went through school and just the way school is organized. I know. We know so much yeah. about it. It's hilarious to me that we still are in this. Like, there's enough. Like, we figured out that it's not ideal the way we do stuff. So it's crazy. What's cool is that I think more and more parents are, you know, becoming aware of that. And so I think people are doing things outside like even if they're going through like a, a traditional school structure they're finding ways to like educate and and, and with their kids and, and give them different opportunities i mean even the, the way you're communicating with domenico on like college like that's like probably a conversation that maybe even yourself wouldn't have had 20 years ago if it, you know just the way schooling has gone where i know that's like 15 20 years ago i would have thought like oh i'm gonna my kid's gonna go to college he's gonna do this and it's like Wow, no, I have a different, a total different perspective on how I would communicate that um, to him when he gets to that age. Now. It makes me sad because um, I mean, my wife and I are the same in the sense that we both love learning. Like what we do for fun is we try to learn things about random. Like I love learning, I love reading, I love, and yet I hated school. Mm -hmm. I hated the environment. I hated school. She was so unstimulated in school. Hated it so much. My wife literally thought she was dumb. She's like, oh, I'm not smart. I'm not good at this stuff. My wife's extremely intelligent. Like in very, she absorbs stuff very, very quickly. But that's how bad school was for someone who's intelligent, loves to learn, just doesn't fit in that environment. How yeah. sad is that? How many I people know. slip through the cracks uh, because of the, you know, that's like, hey, let's take this kid and force him to learn like this. Like, I don't yeah. learn like that. All this you is, learn is that you're not doing well. <laughs> that's what I'm it, saying. Oh, it's so frustrating. It'll crush you. Yeah. I had clients whose uh, son struggled with school. Very smart. And I know and now he's an adult, right? Because I trained these people a long time ago. They were smart enough, and this is kudos to them. They were smart enough to take their kid out of school. And he was in a good school. They lived in a good area. So, you know, quote unquote, good school. They pulled him and they homeschooled him. And why? Because it was crushing his self-esteem. He started hating himself. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart. You meet this kid. He was just like bright, intelligent kid. He just didn't, again, this, the structure of it didn't was- Didn't fit in the box. Didn't fit. They pulled him. They homeschooled him. And he's this young entrepreneur. You put him in any, any environment, he's comfortable as hell with himself. You know, he doesn't, you know, he's, he's just this really confident, like they totally made the right decision. I couldn't imagine if they forced his ass to fit into that box- what that would have done to the poor kid as he, as he had grown up, you know, makes yeah. me really sad. Yeah. I think, I mean, my personal experience or thoughts around like, you know, the, the way we do education right now, the greatest value that you get is the ability to discipline yourself to do something maybe you don't like 
and still persevere through it. I really feel like that's the uh, not to say that, of course, all the uh, knowledge and that you acquire during those years, but it's very rare that I meet somebody who's our age that says, oh, man, what I my eight year or four year degree I use all the time. The biggest value most of them had got for that was, man, that was hard. Yeah. It was hard in and in a, at a time where you're distracted, yeah. you know, and going out and partying and doing things like that is something that you want to do in your late teens and early 20s. And you had to make sacrifice. You had, you had to delay gratification. Mm -hmm. You had to discipline yourself. You had to build good behaviors. Like, man, that to me is where that's the, the gold in the, the education process today is just, is just simply that, which can be taught in other ways. I don't, I think the, the value of the degree itself and what you, you know, supposedly learn in school is the least valuable thing about school. Yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I agree across the board. I think that the, the problem is when, the kid, you know, rather than having a teacher or a system that's like, hey, let's um, let's you learn, you like to learn like this. Let's move in this direction. Or rather than doing that, the kid learns that they're bad, they're stupid, that they're ostracized, or that even worse is what's happening now. They lower the standards mm -hmm. so that every kid passes. So rather than helping the kid figure this out, it's like, oh, you can't do this. Here, we'll make it so easy that now you could pass. Like they're gonna teach this kid nothing. Yeah. If you do shit like that. So now along these lines, speaking along these lines of personal growth and stuff, study comes out. I got to check. I got to read to you guys the title of the study. I'd love your speculation on it because um, it's causing a lot of controversy now really? for yes. Now for me and you guys, you're probably not going to think it's that controversial, but to a lot of people, this is uh, very, very um, controversial. Here's the title. This was in science daily and this was out of the university of South Australia. Researchers are calling for exercise to be a mainstay, mainstay approach for managing depression as a new study, ready for this? A new study shows that physical activity is one and a half, okay? 150 times, 150% more effective. So one and a half times more effective than, than counseling or the leading medications. Wow. Not as effective, 50% more effective. Wow. And That's it's- exercise. Yeah. It's not counseling. It's not drugs. It's literally activity and Dang. exercise. How freaking amazing, like remarkable. Uh, well, I, I guess for us, we've seen the benefit of that, but I feel like we've known this, but it hasn't been highlighted like that before or studied like that. So it's like to have that knowledge, you know, to not incorporate that with your therapy and with uh, that entire process would seem like, you know, you're, you're not really doing that person justice. Are you seeing it get pushback? Is it is there a controversy? People are like, oh, the study is this, the study is that. Counseling's effective. Medications are effective. I think they're missing the point. Yeah, they're missing it. It's not saying yeah. that those things aren't effective. It's just that these things are, this is that much more well, Look how effective. powerful that is. Yeah, it's a powerful tool. Yeah, and I, and I really, I think if, if you look at exercise as a form of therapy, which now the evidence, so now we can say this. By the way, <clears throat> couldn't say this before, even though we knew it, because of the way that our regulatory system works as trainers. God forbid you said anything like exercise oh, yeah. is therapy, right? You get yeah. fired. Even though we knew it was. We know personally it is. It is for me, for sure. Here's why exercise is so powerful of a therapy. There's acute effects. Uh, it, you know, it produces feel-good hormones. It gets rid of stress physically, puts you in your body, which a lot of people are disconnected, makes you healthier. Your brain, your mind it comes from your brain. Your brain is part of your body. If you're healthier, you'll have a healthier brain. Therefore, healthier mind, obvious. But then here's the other part of it that I think a lot of people are missing. As you continue to pursue exercise and get better at whatever it is you're doing, Pilates, yoga, strength training, running, cycling, swimming, the pursuit of this particular skill is there's a lot of personal growth that happens along the way. Hundred percent. So I that. so I think it's great in the in the short term. I think it's even better in the long term. Well, take take sure. okay take take exercise out of the equation and focus on anything that's related to personal growth that you actually disciplined yourself to do a minimum of three hours a week and think about it because you're making food choices also based off and of just it. trying to get better. Oh yeah. All the time, like so. Think about it. Like so. So say it was you're just you're trying to be a better dad at whatever, or control your temper, or be more empathetic. And you thought about it 
for or, or you practiced it yeah. three hours a week. Yep. You also thought about it right before you diligently ate. practiced it, like yeah. continuously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's not a lot of things, that, and so and and because you're you know initially chasing a look or a scale, you know, weight on the scale. You uh, unconsciously are doing that, and you don't realize it. And to your and you, I yeah, think that's you say, why it's so powerful. Yeah, yeah, I think you say it so eloquently. The way that you just kind of like fall into this like personal growth thing that you may not have really pursued. You were mm -hmm. actually probably driven by an insecurity that got you to move in the right direction. But if you stick to it long enough, you start to connect the dots. The like oh, Trojan shit. horse, do you into it, it? Yeah, yeah, totally. No, and I think that you know how many people don't. They don't want to do personal growth. They don't want yeah. to face those challenges, but they're like, I want to lose 30 pounds. Yeah. And then not realize that they're actually on a pursuit of personal growth. There's definitely something there, though, about getting out of your mind and more in your body. Totally. Because like, just think about how many things we overanalyze and then what that does in terms of like raising your anxiety even more. Because now I have to work on this, but it's like you know your deficits. all, and You keep it all in your mind, and it's like, let's just Dude, work this out. Bro, the you, body. Just, you just like literally describe me. So I'm so <laughs> mental. I'm so cognitively focused. I think about everything. I have a mm -hmm. tendency towards anxiety. I could live in my head all day long. And I've recognized this about myself. And I'm obsessive about exercise. Yes, I had body image issues as a kid, all that stuff. But the reason why now I'm obsessed about exercising is if I don't exercise on a regular basis, I'm literally, I will, I'm not a good person to be around. I'm not, a, I don't think right. Yeah. I don't have the right attitude towards things. It is literally a form of therapy for me that I have recognized that is so profound that if I don't do it, I'm 50% of the person that I normally am. And the longer I don't do it, the worse it gets. So I've recognized this for me, dude. Like it makes me a mm -hmm. way better person um, in all uh, aspects. Uh, I see a future, and I understand why this is controversial, because if you're a therapist, a counselor, psychologist, psychiatrist, mm. and you went to school for a million years, and you spent all this money, and you got all this stuff, and they're like, hey, working out, it's more effective than what you do, you're like, oh, <laughs> you know? But I, I think they're missing the point. I think the point is, and actually good therapists do this already, as part of their therapy, they implement activity. So I don't think this is an either or, by the way. No. And I think it's, a, it, this is part of the, it, but we got to know how effective it is. It's got to be one of the top things. Well, and also to defend, yeah, the, bring the, it in to defend uh, therapy in general, right? Is that the average person is actually more likely to show up to their therapy appointment than they are the gym. And so if you actually did a, a, a fat, if you did a hundred people who had the option to go to therapy or go to the gym, who, and like knowing that the gym was 150% more effective at the end, and we talk about this all the time, right? When we, we take we take apart studies, right? It's like you also have to factor in what are people most like in that state where they're at, right? Yeah. They're not in a good place and they're trying to fix something. Sure. They are more likely to go sit down in a chair and have talk therapy than they are to go to the gym and put actual work. Now I'm gonna so, say, I'm gonna compare apples to apples though. Give them a good trainer and they will show up. Like somebody who understands. I mean, I don't, think, that, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's apples to apples. At the end of the day, I think apples to apples is 100 people, they both have a, a, the choice to consciously show up to a therapy appointment or show up to the gym. Which one are they more likely to do? I guarantee they're more likely to show up to a therapy appointment. If they know that they're treating depression. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I because see. Because it's easier. Right. Yeah. yeah. Both people are treating depression. Both people know these I studies. See. I yeah. see what you okay? mean. Okay. All hundred people. Right. And we talk about this a lot. Like behavior has to be factored in these studies all the time. And what are people more likely to do? I think they're more likely to go sit in a chair because when you're, mm -hmm. when you are depressed and down, so like that the last boy, thing you want to do is work. Out. Yeah. The last thing you yeah. want to do is go push yourself and, and, and make good habits like that. I, I can at least go show up to my therapy appointment and yeah. bitch to my therapist for an hour. Like that to me Dude. is, is an easier in. And then the ideal world is that a good therapist is, you know, why we're sitting here and we're talking about is it. like, Hey, you yeah. know what do, do you really well is, is get, you know maybe go to the gym and do X Y and Z or I do think, a walk right yeah. right get them going. Well, the irony of this conversation is it's funny because when I first was um, like I moved out to do a uh, personal train on my own and and do the independent uh, training kind of structure of my business and all the stuff and I was like really getting into the entrepreneurial side of the whole thing and my sister in law uh, is a therapist and and we we kind of talk and stuff about how, how she was moving into her own practice and kind of starting her own thing and I just like knew that I had all these conversations with my clients all the time when we would actually go for these walks right and I would actually take them out and we do hikes together and all this stuff and all of this would 
would come out, right? Like all of these um, stories and, and, you know, past with, with, you know, what was happening with their family and all of a sudden I'm like kind of pitching to her. I'm like, man, it'd be amazing if like you incorporated like walking totally. into your practice and like, she kind of laughed about it, but was like, yeah, that might be kind of, you know, a good idea. But like just to hear like now this as being like a, a valid uh, option and, and real helpful kind of yeah. way to, to look at it. I'm like, dude, that, that would make perfect sense. By the yeah. way, when I became a better trainer and I would have clients that would hire me and you could clearly see that they were depressed or anxious, our workouts often consisted of a walk yeah, yeah. or we're going to stretch yeah. a little bit or we do one exercise. Now, early me was like, waste of time. We've got to get you sweating and sore. Later on, I was like, oh no, this is having some, some pretty, you know, this is having some benefit. The fact that they showed up and we're just moving. I actually had a client once that 50% of the time would show up, they were going through a really challenging time. And they 50% of the time they'd show up and say, and they, they used to pay me hundred bucks an hour for this. They'd show up and say, can we just go for a walk? Mm -hmm. no, no training. And we just would go for a walk, you yeah. know, yeah. just being, just moving made a huge difference. Yeah. Anyway, we're supposed to mention Viore. I got to tell you guys a uh, compliment my wife gave me. She said, this is true, hundred <laughs> percent, that uh, Viore makes me look a lot sexier. <laughs> that's a hundred percent. Did she give you a scale? <laughs> she just, when I, she, when I wear like the, the, I'll wear like the workout clothes type yeah. of stuff and I'll come out, I'll come downstairs, take a shower, come downstairs. Mm. She'll be like, man, you look really sexy. I'll be like, oh really? She goes, yeah, I like the way that Viore looks like. I'm like, you mind like, if I say it, like, this? It like hugs you. Mind so if I, say I wish I, I, <laughs> She's I, like, wish I remember it. what family member I was talking to. It was when I was at the wedding. I can't remember who it was, but they complimented you as the, the, your appearance appearance on the show has changed the most. Oh everybody. wow! Yeah, yeah. not wow. physically. But well, like I mean, the, when you start real low, it's not hard. <laughs> your style's gotten way better. Let's you put it that mean? way. Yeah. Like, when you're at God zero, that, thank God for that Viore sponsorship. Yeah. Oh my God! <laughs> when you're at a zero, what, what know, a come up! Yeah. Improving twice as much moves me up to a two or a one. Or whatever. So that's, that's not hard, bro. <laughs> when you can do one push up, you can double your push ups by doing two. Yeah, <laughs> that's how statistics works. Yeah. Everybody, do we have a shout out for today? Anybody have anybody? We want to, you know, shout out Mike Matthews, our good friend. Yeah, yeah, Mus I think was he Muscle for Life or Muscle for Fitness? Is his uh, Instagram Muscle handle? for Life? Is that his? Is that his handle? I'll double. Check no, I think his it. handle is Fitness for some reason. It's uh, yeah, he yeah, it's Muscle. Oh, Muscle for Life Fitness okay. is his handle. All one word. He's no actually, I don't know. Uh, I think we told you guys this. Doug and I, when we uh, were putting together Maps Anabolic and talking about, you know, we first started creating the podcast and like we're going to navigate the space. We actually looked at Mike Matthews as a good example of how to do fitness uh, the right way. It was so filled with garbage. And I remember, I think, Doug, you found him. You're like, yeah. check out this guy's stuff. He's really good. He's smart. He, he says true things, and he writes in a great way. You know, you know the thing that I think is most impressive about him, and I think you guys would agree, is you know, we, we tend to connect more to the personal trainer who's or the fitness guru person, uh, social media star, whatever, that has put... 10, 15, 20 years into training clients. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, over the like super educated PhD or person who's just a, a study repeat. Yeah, study guy, nerd. And Mike is actually kind of the the study nerd guy. I mean, he openly admits like he was a he was a marketing guy mm -hmm. um, before he got into the the fitness pursuit. And he really was like pursuing fitness for himself. And then obviously, like a lot of like us, get passionate and kind of nerdy about something and goes down the rabbit hole. And considering he doesn't have, you know, thousands of hours of training clients like we all have, he like really has a good understanding yeah. on He's a real student how to yeah how to take how to take these studies and uh, apply them to r real life like i think that yes he that, does that so well that's rare it, like for someone like you that. never find that in somebody who hasn't trained lots of people he, but he'll communicate what uh is important what's actually going to be used and what's relevant which people who are like the science-based fitness people who've never trained people have a, do a terrible job of. They always communicate stuff that we roll our eyes and go, that is a waste of time. You're splitting hairs and that doesn't make a difference. He knows how to decipher that like a trainer, mm -hmm. like somebody who's worked with a lot of people. Yeah, so yeah. great follow. Yep. Hey, check this out. Uh, do you want to improve your cognitive function, improve the feelings of motivation, innovation, decrease inflammation? Cannabinoids can actually do all of that there's a company we work with called Ned 
that makes a hemp oil product that's high in CBD, but also high in all of the other beneficial cannabinoids. So you get this entourage effect. They have a product called Brain Blend, which also includes botanicals that have been shown to improve the health of your brain. By the way, this is one of the only CBD products you actually feel. All the other ones on the market, you take it, and then you're like, is it doing anything? Try this one. Take it. About an hour later, you know that you took something. You really do feel this. Go check this company out. Go to helloned.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com forward slash mind pump. Then use the code mind pump for 15% off. All right, back to the show. Our first caller is Melissa from Tennessee. Melissa, how's it going? How can we help you? Hey, you guys. How are you? Great. Great. Good. Um, well, I just want to say thank you for your thought leadership and everything you're doing for um, the community, whether that's people in health and fitness or wellness or entertainment. Um, it's amazing. And Dave Ramsey always jokes that his name is a cuss word in houses. And I feel like Mind Pump might be coming a cuss word in my house because I'm always like, oh, I heard this today on Mind Pump or learn this and we need to try it. Um, Perfect. That's awesome. But uh, my question is around uh, anabolic advanced and where to go um, from here. Um, I'm halfway through phase two and have noticed like two major things from it. Um, my strength gains, of course, have gone up. Um, I've been lifting for about 10 or 12 years. Um, and usually when I work on increasing my strength, my ligaments, tendons, and my joints kind of pay a toll in that. Um, I was speaking to one gear, a guy that was running gear, and he said that if you're on gear, your joints feel dried up. And I've never run gear, but my joints, if I, if I chase that strength gain goal, my joints kind of feel dry. With this program, um, my ligaments and my uh, tendons and joints have stayed really healthy. I, I feel very strong and confident in my body. And I don't feel like I've given that up for strength. Um, I don't feel like I'm going to lean down and put a sock on and throw my back out. And um, the second thing I've gotten from Anabolic Advanced is um, the aesthetics part. I've I've been active my whole life and always stayed around 14 or 15 percent body fat, just maintenance. So I have never really cared about how I look. That's just what I maintain. I just like to pick heavy things up and put them back down and feel strong. Um, but on this program, I feel like I'm starting to see definition in my arms and my stomach, um, my lower body. And I like that. Um, so where to go from here, keeping in mind, I don't want to give up compound lifts. I don't care about bench press, but I don't want to let go of my deadlifting. Um, the strength gains, I'd like to continue to get stronger in the gym and maybe some aesthetics. And then I'm pursuing mounted shooting. So to keep my back healthy for that. I have the perfect program yeah. for you. She says to you on here, I have prime anywhere suspension, but I'm looking for a heavier hitter program map strong. Oh yeah. You'll I love, love that. that for, for everything you described that you like. And I think you're going to see uh, incredible gains from that. Yeah. What's cool about this, Melissa, is you've been working out for a long time. 10 years is like, you know, once you cross that consistent six or seven year mark, like you're, you're, you're really figuring things out. Uh, you kind of know what works for your body, what doesn't work for your body. The negative is it's, it's hard to progress. Like at a certain point, it's like you can't keep getting stronger forever. No. And yet here you are seeing strength gains. Here you are feeling your joints feel good. Um, now I'm not, I'm not just doing a commercial for maps anabolic advanced, although this kind of is one I'm actually, what I'm trying to convey here is you are following really, you're following programming that is well done and works for your body. And this is exactly how you should feel. You mentioned that you had talked to somebody who said when they run gear, they feel a particular way. So for people who don't know running gear is, um, that, that means on steroids. So somebody takes steroids will say, Oh, my joints, your joints will feel dry. And this will, that's not the same thing as what you may feel when your joints start to ache, when you're training in a particular way, anabolic steroids cause muscle tissue to grow faster than connective tissue can, 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 um, catch Keep up, up to. That's what they're noticing. Um, in okay. your case, you, you were just following programming that wasn't ideal and possibly you were overdoing it. The way you're feeling now is how you should feel 
when you follow any program. Now, that doesn't mean any program is going to give you the same kind of strength gains and muscle gains. MAPS Anabolic Advanced is like pure muscle, pure strength. Like that's the goal. Other programs, mm -hmm. the goals are a little different. But the way you're feeling right now, the words you're using, confident, I feel good. I feel like I can move. I feel like, um, you know, I'm looking better. I feel <clears> strong. <throat> like that's how you should feel following any program that is appropriate for your body. And I am 100% on board with what Adam said. I think MAP Strong, the other program I would say would be MAP Symmetry, would be another program I think you would benefit from because you've been working out for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, it's highly likely you've never run a you know unilateral style workout program for you know longer than a week or two. Most people haven't. So those two programs, I think you're going to really enjoy, and you're going to really enjoy the benefits with Map Strong in particular. You'll notice uh, a lot of benefits in your posterior chain, your yep. glutes, your oh, hamstrings, yeah. and your back. And then the the exercises that are in there, some of them are different. And so for someone who's experienced like yourself, you're just gonna have a lot of fun. You're gonna love strong, doing yeah. new exercises that uh, that really have this carryover to everyday life, especially the stuff that you wrote down that you were interested. In. I noticed you wrote down, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like rock climbing and, and riding horses and stuff like that. I think you'll really enjoy it. I love your mentality too, going into training and, um, you know, just focusing on getting stronger. And I mean, that's a rare thing. It's usually something we have to help kind of coach and guide people towards in terms of like their, uh, mentality going into it. And it's very aesthetic driven for the most part and, and the majority of it in the beginning. So I actually had a little bit of a different, uh, did, have you done like a full aesthetic, like hypertrophy style kind of program before? No, the, I used to do Olympic lifting training. Yeah. And so that I started in power lifting and then, um, you know, was doing like two and a half times my body weight, not wanting to compete and with a bad back injury. So I was like, why am I doing this? So then I went to Olympic lifting yeah. for a while and then um, came over to you guys and have been following um, the programs that I wrote down and now with anabolic and advanced. Yeah, I was actually going to steer you more towards aesthetic, which I was surprised, you know, with strong. But I mean, strong is a great one for that, for building up more, especially the posterior chain, like they're mentioning. But I mean, I love, I don't, so, okay, if we don't normally do this, where we tell somebody like, this is, how, if I had you as a client, I already feel like I have enough information on you on, on how I'd like to run like our next nine months. And it would be strong, followed by symmetry, followed by aesthetic. Yeah, there you that, go. That would be like- all the best of all of them. Yeah, that lineup would be just uh, incredible for you. I think you're going to, I think you'll like all of them. Uh, symmetry will probably be the most challenging mentally because there's a phase at the beginning of it that's uh, isometric and, and you slow down a bit and then you have to go to unilateral. Yeah, it'll which, be the most different. Out of yeah, the that'll be the most different. Uh, but I think that order would be, would be epic. Yeah, but we'll send you strong if you don't have strong, Melissa. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. And like I said, everything that you're doing. Thank you so much. Awesome. You got it. Right, Thanks it for up. calling in. Recording. Let, so let that be a lesson for everybody, especially females listening right now. One thing she said was uh, she her body fat's you know 15%. That's lean. I mean, that's visible definition. And she's like, but you know, I'm just, I just, I'm chasing, I just really focus more on performance and strength. If you're stronger, if your performance is better, if your mobility is better mm -hmm. and you feel good, the side effect of that is you look good. Yep. If you try to look good, oftentimes you screw all of that up. So yeah. let that be a lesson to people. Like focus so on those things. So easy to say, hard to uh, Correct. apply. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But it's wonderful. Like when you look in the mirror, you're like, oh my God, I, I didn't realize I was like, like my body was changing visually. This is really awesome. Like that's a great yeah. feeling versus constantly trying to visually change your body and you're just beating yourself up in the gym. Nothing's working. Next thing you know, you're going backwards, and then it feels like a nightmare. That being said, I hope she takes the advice and runs all three because I would love to talk to someone that like her who's mm -hmm. got this kind her, of experience. Her body would be yeah, unreal. That kind of experience, yeah. that right, the right mentality going into it, like that order after what she's doing right now would be phenomenal. Yeah. What's so. re what's really exciting is that Anabolic Advance only been out for what is it two three months now? It's only been a few months. We're getting lots of reports now of people saying stuff like this. So I love that. I love when we write a program. Three, four months later, we get people yep. emailing us in, telling us how how awesome it is. So that's, that's great. Feels awesome. good on that ego, huh? Our next caller is Haley from Arizona. Haley, what's happening? How can we help you? Hi, guys. It's such a privilege to be here. Thank you for your time. You got it. My question is about reverse dieting. I've been lifting for about seven years. And since I found you guys, I've been doing max programs. 
Um, when I was finishing MAPS Powerlift and going into Anabolic Advanced, I knew that it was a great opportunity to reverse diet for the first time, honestly, since I started lifting. So I took some advice that Adam gave a caller about adding steps along with calories each week and just kind of assessing the progress as you go. It's been working better than I ever could have imagined, to be honest. Um, I want to keep going. I've been loving adding steps and breaking up my day. I have a very sedentary job. So getting up and going has been amazing and eating more and getting out of the restrictive mindset has been life changing. Um, but I'm going to run into a roadblock pretty soon where I am going to run out of hours in a day to keep adding more steps. So does that mean I have to quit reverse dieting altogether, which I don't want to do? Or should I kind of force my way through that and make some sacrifices with other time commitments just for the sake of the reverse diet? And then I can come back down from the steps later on. Or is that just a bad idea? Haley, altogether? have you seen the treadmill beds that they make? <laughs> I'm just kidding. No. I'm just kidding. He's being you know stupid. what? Yeah, no, you know what? We never, uh, we probably never specified because that's true. Somebody heard that advice and then would be like, uh, I'm at 25,000 steps. Like, what do I do? Well, now? there's, uh, and there's not uh, a wrong answer necessarily here. Let's, uh, where are you at calorie wise right now? That's more important to know where you're at and, and how you feel. I'm at 2,300 calories and 15,000 steps, okay. which is doable. And I could add a few more thousand and it'll be fine. But I think when I get closer to 20,000, it's not going to be the most realistic thing long term. So, so there's, there's lots of different things that I'll do when I get to this point, right? So you can increase the intensity in the workout because that extra demand and intensity is going to require a, a higher caloric intake. You could start to now do like uh, moderate cardio. So stuff that's not like super intense, but now maybe I get on the, the treadmill or the elliptical for 20 or 30 minutes and I'll do like maybe a little bit of intervals or start to push a little bit. Uh, on there, but not really intense because that's not my goal. My goal is to reverse diet right now and and probably build muscle. Um, so you could do that uh, is an option. I, you can keep going the way you're going until you get to that place where I, and normally I found for myself and clients is when they start getting about 20,000 steps, when they get 20,000 and beyond, it, they seem to require uh, you know additional uh, additional forms of, of cardio in order to hit their step goal. But it, you, there's not. This isn't like a like you have to just keep going this way all the way forever. I think you're already heading in the right direction. Hopefully, you can get yourself up to about twenty six to twenty eight hundred calories by the time you get around twenty thousand steps, and should be in a really good position to decide if you want to reverse and go the other direction, or pick up intensity in the training, or uh, start to add a little bit of cardio in the day. Yeah. So, so Haley, my advice can be a little bit different because the point of a reverse diet is to teach your body to burn more calories on its own. The, the, what you're doing right now is you're trying to burn off the extra calories you're adding to your diet. So you're adding calories and you're burning it off with extra steps, which, uh, to a point that's great because it increases activity after a certain point, it's no longer reverse dieting. It's just adding activity to burn the extra calories. We want your metabolism to speed up. So 20,000 steps a day is a lot for some people. 15,000 steps for some people is a lot to maintain on a realistic basis. So here's what I, here's what I would tell you to do. I would tell you to bump your calories, stop increasing your steps, and watch yourself in the gym, and you're probably just going to get stronger. There's an amount there's a there's, there's a, an, a, an amount of calories your body will burn with the same lean body mass. Uh, it depending on whether or not your metabolism wants to decide to be more or less efficient it doesn't require more activity. Well, that's a really good. You're, it's a really good point that you're bringing up right now. Where did you come from? Like, where were your calories at when you started the reverse diet uh, at? And where are we at? So we're at 23 now. So where were you before? I was at 1,800 calories and about 10,000 steps. Okay, yeah, you could probably jump bigger leaps like so if you're going to go up in steps again is uh, you must you're probably only moving about 100 calories at a time i'd probably jump to 250 calories because to sal's point he's right you, the idea of me teaching people this isn't like 
oh, every time you add calories, you're trying to cancel those extra calories by burning, right. it, burning it off. It's really just to help mitigate the weight gain and the psychological thing that happens to a lot of people when you reverse diet them. If you reverse diet somebody and they don't add any more steps whatsoever, sometimes that additional two, three, four, five pounds that goes on the scale, they start to freak out a little bit. So a lot of times what I like to do is while I increase calories, I also increase steps. So it's a slower, more gra gradual gain on the scale. But if you're not seeing any gain on the scale whatsoever, or if we're not building muscle because all we're doing is turning around and burning it off through steps, we're technically not really reverse dieting the way we want to look to Sal's point. And if that's the case, then I would, I'd bump the calories up even higher or bump them up small, but don't add steps. Yeah. Let me, how do you, let me ask you this. How do you feel you're doing what, how many steps right now? 15,000? 16,000. Yeah. 15,000. Oh, okay. How, how, how does it feel to you? Does it feel like you got to really consciously try to hit those steps or is this like, oh, I love, I love this. This is great. Honestly, I love it. And okay. so far it's fitting in seamlessly. Okay. I would keep it at 15,000 and just keep increasing the calories uh, uh, over the weeks and focus on getting stronger. I don't think there's any need to increase your steps. You're at a wonderful step count for health. Um, plus the calorie burn you get from the extra steps that wears off. Your body adapts pretty quickly to that. I mean, there's plenty of really overweight uh, mail carriers and construction workers and people who move a lot. Your body adapts to that very quickly. The idea is to get a metabolism that's faster on its own. 15,000 steps, if you're doing that and you feel good, I would just start bumping calories and not adding extra steps. Keep them where they're at and then focus on getting stronger. Are you following any of our pro? You're following MAPS Powerlift or are you following something else right now? I just finished Powerlift, did a deload week, and I just started Anabolic Advanced. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That's, start, that's bumping your, start bumping your calories, keep your steps where they're at, and here's what's going to happen. You're just going to build muscle and get stronger. Yeah. Yep. Great. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. It. And the only other question that goes along with that is once I reach this point where I stop adding calories and I'm comfortable, how long should I stay there before I start cutting? I don't want to do it too soon. I want to do it the right way. You don't necessarily have to cut. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you could kind of hover around. If you're happy where you're at, you can hover around there. If you want to lean out a little bit, then you can start leaning out right away. But again, I'd do it very slow and gradual, just like you did on the reverse on the way up. I'd come on the way back down that way if you're trying to lean out. Otherwise, when you reach this area of, let's say, 27, 2,900 calories a day, it's a very healthy place to be. You're active, you're training. Um, I mean, your body is probably going to- probably just get leaner anyway. Yeah, you will. You'll just continually probably get leaner hovering around that caloric intake while you're, you're still tra strength training and moving. Do you know what your body fat percentage is at right now, Haley? I do not. Okay. Do you have, do you have an idea? What's like? How, like, would you say you're like pretty lean, or would you say you need to lose X amount of pounds? I don't know. I could probably lose fifteen pounds at the end of the cut. Would be ideal. Okay. What do you mind if I ask your height and your body weight? Yeah, sure. I'm I'm five eight and about one eighty five okay. pounds. Yeah, I you know you could definitely you're. I think what Adam said is ideal. If you do this, if you really want to do this like the right way and have fun with it. I would hit that maintenance, then keep it at maintenance and keep trying to get stronger and you'll you'll get leaner yeah. on your own just slowly. I mean, you could cut your calories and make it happen a little faster, but wouldn't it be great to lose whatever amount of weight goal you have and still eat like 2,800 calories a day? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a dream. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And another great strategy is to get, you know, when you make a transition out of this program into the next one, say you go into something like performance and you're, you're now let's say your calorie maintenance is around 2,800 calories. Well, you hit 28 most days and maybe a couple days you have two or three days where you drop down to 25 and yeah. go back up to 28. So you have, uh, you know, intermittently have two or three low calorie days, lower, I shouldn't say low, just a few hundred calories less while also running a new program. I think the combination of that, and you'll see a nice gradual lean out, out uh, going through that program. Totally. Are those pictures on your Instagram? Uh, oh, are yeah, the, she looks are great. Those, are those uh, updated? Yeah. Oh yeah. No. You, yeah. Well, okay. That's yeah. Recently, actually. I should, yeah. No, I should have known better than to ask if you need to lose weight. You got great. You're lean. Yeah. No. You look great. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I okay. Here's the deal. You look really good. I would keep your calories at maintenance, and you're gonna naturally just start to get leaner. Oh but, shit! You're strong, and you're strong, you're strong as shit too. Yeah. Yeah. No. You don't need it. What you are you pulling there? Three hundred pounds. On deadlift, three twenty five was the PR I got wow. from Maps Starlift. Wow. Wow. <laughs> uh, are you getting Man. stronger on Maps Anabolic Advanced too? Um, well, it's just the beginning of week two. Oh, okay. So I imagine I will, but Shit, I'm not there you don't, yet. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. even. I, wouldn't I would even, not worry about a yeah, cut. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about a cut either. You look good. 
You're doing yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. No, you're you, you tell you're strong, you're solid, like Yeah, keep it to that. Keep it get you know, get it up to where you're happy and then just keep it at maintenance and then you'll just slowly start to get leaner and keep a great fast metabolism. Yeah, yeah definitely. Thanks, guys. Yep, you got it. For sure. Right. I'm glad you glad you pulled those photos. Yeah, up. thanks, Doug. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, I should have known better. I, you know, I know, right? She was she's tall, five five yeah, eight, eight. one eighty something. Might may sound on the heavier side, but she's not. She Muscular. is like, yeah. yeah, small waist, like built legs, yeah. strong as hell. Boy, what a, what a great example of how different weight looks. Oh yeah, if mm -hmm. it's like someone who's got muscle versus someone who doesn't. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying. 100%. She don't need it. I know she no. said 15 pounds, but I, she don't. No, she, she's fine. I mean, it, she would just naturally get leaner as she continued down this path, but she's got, she's, and, and, and look, looking at the amount of muscle and strength that she has, mm -hmm. uh, if she just starts to, if she continues to reverse diet, but not increase steps, she's just going to get strong. Yep. Like she's already strong as hell. She's just going to keep getting stronger and stronger. So yeah, yeah, no. that's awesome. Our next caller is Megan from Massachusetts. Hi, Megan. How can we help you? Hi, how are you guys? Good. Um, I just wanted to say thanks, first of all, just everyone always thanks for just being so real and um, you keep me grounded and put things into perspective when I need it. So thank you for that. Awesome. Um, my first question, or I have a couple questions all related to the same thing. So I'll just give you a quick background. Um, I've been seriously strength training for about a year now. And um, I just started anabolic a few weeks ago. Um, I'm doing the at-home mod and I'm, I'm using power blocks, um, not dumbbells. I have the adjustable power blocks. So those are a bit clunky. So I don't know if that's part of my issue. Um, I've seen a lot of changes over the past year and then even more since starting anabolic. Um, but one area that is seeming to be a weakness is um, in my hamstrings. And uh, one exercise I'm having trouble with are the sumo deadlifts. I don't feel like I'm connecting with them and I'm not sure if I'm just not feeling them in the right spot. Um, I feel like I don't have enough range of motion. Like I go down to the ground too fast. I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, and my, I wasn't sure, like I'm pretty short. So I don't know if the less of range of motion has anything to do with my height or if I'm just not executing it properly. Um, I don't know if you want to start with the question or. Well, no, no, so, so, that. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good start. I think that this is actually more common than you think. A lot of times that, uh, the sumo squat like that or sumo deadlift sometimes will feel like a squat. And so people will actually feel a lot yeah. in their quads and glutes because there's there's less hip extension in the sumo deadlift than there is in like a conventional deadlift. Are you holding one uh, power block and are you holding it vertically? I have tried it like every way possible. I've done two power blocks like horizontally. I've tried one vertically, which I don't like at all. I find that worse, but maybe... I don't know if I'm doing it right. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like, look, the, the, the shorter you are, the shorter the range of motion tends to be because uh, plates and weights tend to be the same same size. Now, that doesn't mean that the exercise yeah. uh, is wrong for you. You can uh, stand on plates. plates or two things that will lift your feet so you have a little bit more of a range of motion. I will say this, though. If you do that, go way lighter because you've been training in a particular mm -hmm. range of motion – and a new range yeah. of motion makes it is going to make it far more unstable. So be very careful. The second, okay. the second thing is uh, the hamstrings are still being active. It's not necessary. You're not necessarily going to feel them though on an exercise like this because they're not in a stretched position, and they're also not going to be in a fully contracted position. Like if you want to feel your hamstrings, you could do like a lying leg curl on a physio ball, and you'll feel them. Does that make yeah. that a better hamstring exercise? No. So some exercises you'll feel and target muscles mm -hmm. more than others. If you're doing the form and technique right and you're getting stronger, those muscles are still working. It's just like feeling the hamstrings mm -hmm. in like squats and in, in like sumo deadlifts and stuff like that. For some people, they're just not, especially if you're flexible, you're just not going to. sort of the conundrum with compound lifts yeah. in general. I mean, it's a... To be able to feel specific muscles and, and what you're doing is a movement that's a, you know, it's going to provide this systemic uh, type of stimulus. So your whole body's like receiving benefit from it. Um, so, th and this is too why the load uh, needs to be substantial. It's tough to kind of like, you know, really get a good uh, compound uh 
lift for with using dumbbells. I mean, I'm just saying you're compromising that to begin with. And, then, and that's just kind of like yeah. what people need to realize is like, it is great to have the convenience of dumbbells. And like we put the blueprints out there. It's not ideal in terms of the benefits you're going to receive from the compound lift aspect. Well, so. especially a movement like that. Yeah. Too. Like you think of the movements. It's that- just not going to have the same type of like thunder uh, you would get otherwise. Yeah. But you know, are, are the dumbbells heavy enough for you? <clears throat> Do you feel like they're pretty heavy that you can, cause you've been training for a year so you might still be at the point where the dumbbells heavy is plenty heavy. Yeah, I feel like right now I'm kind of, I did it with, um, they go up to 50 pounds each. Um, and so right now I'm doing about 50 or 60 pounds total. So um, I, I, but I wasn't connecting. Like I said, I wasn't sure. Like I kept changing the weight because I wasn't sure what I was supposed to be feeling. Like I wasn't feeling it in my hamstrings. I was more in my quads, like you had said. Um, so I kind of just kept adjusting the weight. So with that in mind, I'll just, you know, so- take a better track. It could also be, there There could be, I mean, this is where the value of like, and I'll have Doug put you in our private forum. This is where like, it's, okay. it's nice to be able to see what we're discussing right now, because mm-hmm. sometimes when I, when I teach a sumo deadlift, the tendency is to, to get in, get in position, open up their stance and then squat down to pick up the bar versus sliding the hips out and hinging down to get the bar and just you squatting down and it puts you in this position where you're going to drive up with your glutes and your quads more versus when I teach a client how to, to load on a sumo is I, I'm going to put, I'm going to slide their hips all the way back so they can feel some tension in their hamstring before they grab the grab the bar. So this could be a little bit of a just a yeah, it adjustment. Could be a thing yeah, it could too. be a little bit of adjustment on your technique of 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 loading the bar. To Sal's point, though, they're getting worked right. So no matter what, if you if you dr- if you bend the knee down to pick a bar up and you stand all the way up, the hamstrings are included in that movement. But if you're if we were trying to put more emphasis on there. Uh, how I how you get up to the bar and load it and create that tension before we pull up could make the difference too. So it'll so, yeah. It'll Adam, Adam makes a really good point. There's a difference between a sumo squat and a sumo deadlift. So the difference is this: uh, when you're holding the dumbbells, a sumo squat, the dumbbells are going to be more in between your legs. If you're doing a sumo deadlift, imagine the handle of the dumbbells being a barbell that goes across all the way across your body. You wouldn't be able to put the barbell between your legs because it would hit your shins right? So place the dumbbells where the barbell would be. And that means you're going to have to do more of a hip hinge than a squat, meaning your your butt's going to have to kind of slide back. You still squat down, but you're not doing like just a squat where you're super upright. Cause otherwise the bar, imagine if there was a barbell, right? It would, you wouldn't be able to do that because it would hit your shins. It would be in front. Right. In other words, it would be in front of you right. a little bit, not right in between your legs. And that- you keeping those weights in front of you is going to force you to counterbalance by sliding the hips back further. So this could be, like I said, if I can get a video of you doing this and the guys can, and I can look at it, we can make some possible subtle adjustments of, oh, okay, this is what I want you to do. Move the bar, move the dumbbells out a little bit more, slide the hips back more until you feel the hamstrings, then grab the dumbbells. Then we might yeah. feel more there. So that's also a, a, a possible. Now, one of the things that you said was, uh, you know, I don't know what I should be feeling with certain exercises. Uh, you want to feel the target muscle with other exercises. What you want is really tight, good form and you want to maximize the leverage and the technique and the force and you're not necessarily trying to feel anything a deadlift is like that when i'm doing a deadlift i'm not trying to feel my lats or my glutes or anything i'm trying to have perfect form use a lot of force and lift heavy weight with really good technique i'm not trying to feel any specific kind of muscle because that's not going to make the deadlift as effective it's it's really about the movement more than it is about the muscle. Now, if you want to feel the hamstrings, do you, and like I said, do you have a physio ball at home? Do you have a big, one of those big Swiss balls or yoga balls? Yeah. 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 And so I've been using that, um, in the, uh, foundational day two, they have the phys- the leg curls. Yeah. There you go. I bet you feel the hamstrings yeah. on that. Yes. I feel it there. I feel it. If I ever just do a stiff flat or a single leg deadlift, like I can feel it in those there movements, but this wasn't yeah. feeling, um, so thank you. My the next part of my question though was just in general, my hamstrings um, don't seem to be like picking up the pace with the rest of my body. Um, so I didn't know if I should add in more hamstring work or switch other things out. Um, well, and in I, addition, to, sorry, go ahead. I would follow the program as laid out, and then I would actually do maps aesthetic. So and in maps aesthetic, that's we have air. We we teach you how to focus on a lagging body part. So if you were to run aesthetic, you would choose 
hamstrings as your focus. And then that that teaches you how to program oh. uh, specific stuff that's in addition to your foundational days for your hamstrings. Yeah. So I, I would run it as it's laid out. I would practice a sumo. The sumo deadlift is such a great movement to practice and get good at it. And that that might be what's going on right now is just a learning curve to get better at it. Not to mention we're also challenged because we're using dumbbells. So, you know, I, the fact that, you, you know, you give it some time for you to get better at the technique of this. I wouldn't abandon it. Um, just because you want the because the hamstrings are going to get worked in this. You have this is maps anabolic you're following, right? Yes. Are you doing your trigger sessions? I am, and I'm trying to focus them mainly on my lower body. I'll do a couple upper body, and then I do mainly um, other like lower body squats, lunges, okay, um, toe touch. When you do when you do the leg curls on the physio ball on your foundational day, how many reps do you normally do? Um, I want to say I did like 10 cause I think it was eight to 12. And I think that was somewhere before the ball just kind of like <laughs> gets away from me. Yeah. So 10, 10 is pretty intense for you. Yeah, I can feel it. All right. Here's what I want you to do on your trigger sessions days. I want you to yeah. use the physio ball and do five reps, leg curls. Okay. Each time, okay. you do, each time you do a trigger session, just do five reps. You'll practice that throughout the day. And then your hamstrings, will, you'll, you'll see your hamstrings, uh, respond for sure. Okay. Awesome. Can I just ask one more part to this? Yes, Sorry. No problem. Um, so my, they're also like my hamstrings get tight and achy. Um, it's always kind of been an issue of mine. Like I have always had really tight hamstrings. I was a dancer and just, I always was behind in my flexibility in that area. And I'm just finding it even when I'm like priming for a workout, I can feel them like pulling. Um, they're just tight. Is there anything that I can do to help that? Yeah. Um, do you, do you eat a lot of processed foods? Um, uh, yeah, probably too much. You do really? Okay. Cause I was going to say, you I should... try not to, but I mean, we've got kids in the house and there's always stuff flying around. And... Yes. You would be surprised, uh, how many people, this is an issue with hydration and not having enough sodium. The reason why I asked you that is, um, do you track your water intake? No, um, not really. I should, but I don't. <laughs> you know what? Try drinking a half a gallon of water a day to a gallon, actually track okay. it. See if it changes anything for you with your hamstrings. You would, you'd be surprised. Okay. Um, yeah. And you had mentioned aesthetic. Does, do they have a, does that have a dumbbell program as well? Or it does. Is it, it, it does. It, it does. does. And I'm going to have, okay. I'm going to have Doug put you in the forum too. So we can take a look at that form. So then when you get a chance, give us a video of like the side and the front profile of you lifting, um, like a little video clip okay. and, and then we can you know, yep. help, help, help critique from there. By the way, the reason why I said uh, drink more okay. water, the reason why I said drink more water with your hamstrings is you made the comment that you were a dancer. It's always been an issue. So I'm assuming that you've probably tried a million and one different stretches and ways to try to get them to not be tight. Yeah. Okay. That's why I went with hydration. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I would say stretch them more, oh. do more mobility. But with your background, um, yeah. and, and you even said you have kids, and here's my experience with people who have kids, especially if you watch your kids a lot. You don't yeah. drink enough water. I, I, I've never met a mom who drinks enough water who watches her kids or dad who uh, who takes care yeah. of it. You just don't. So tr literally get something that you can measure the amount of water and say, and then figure out how many of them yeah. you would need to have to equal a half a gallon to a gallon and then make that a target. Okay. And if in three days you don't notice a difference in your hamstrings, then, uh, then let us know in the forum. But I'm going to bet money that it's that. Okay. Okay. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Megan. Thanks. Yeah, I wanted to make sure I specified because before people listening, what did you who tell need, her to stretch? Yeah, who need to stretch are going to be like, I'm drinking water. What the hell? Yeah. That didn't help me. But, you know, because of her background, I assume that she's tried lots of stretches. Yeah. And, uh, man, I, you would be surprised. I've had, especially, I don't know if she's. Hydration is a, a huge factor yeah. for a lot of people. And I don't know if she stay at home or what, but I know when people are really busy and they have kids, I had clients, they'll actually, like, you don't even tell them to add water. So just write down how many glasses of water. And then they come back to me like, I didn't realize I had like one glass of water all day long. <laughs> the other thing that I would speculate is just the the uh, the over attention to them. She could be just overworking them. Yeah, just you. overworking them. Just mm -hmm. they're just not. You're not letting them recover because you're constantly hammering them because you think they're underdeveloped or they're not strong or whatever. Well, she says they've been tight even when she was a dancer. Yeah, right. So you, I mean, you know what's interesting is you went the right route first. If it's not that, then yeah. I would then before I overdoing think, it. Yes. Yeah, but in my let me ask you guys this: in your experience, if you guys have seen this too, whenever somebody has tightness or muscle cramping due to not having enough water, it almost always is calves, hamstrings, or and feet. It's always 
in the lower extremities that I've noticed. Have you guys seen? quad for me. Yeah. 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 Very strange, uh -huh. right? Yeah. All right. Our next caller is Caitlin from Indiana. Caitlin, how's it going? How can we help you? Hi, guys. Um, Bryce, I just wanted to say thank you like everybody else does. And yeah, I'm just super happy to be on here and I'm excited to get to talk to you guys today. Um, but um, I'm Caitlin, as you guys know, and I'm a freshman in college and my minor is kinesiology. So I'm in a class called Intro to Kinesiology. And as the semester has come to an end, we're beginning to talk about nutrition to finalize everything up. And my professor has been talking a lot about how meat can cause cancer and how a plant-based diet is just overall a lot better for you. And she showed studies of different things that basically just showed that it improved blood markers whenever you go plant-based and everything like that. So I've been really confused and we even watched a documentary called The Game Changers and um, it kind of worshipped veganism and being vegetarian. So um, I just got confused because it just seemed contrary to what you guys say a lot. And I also was vegetarian for probably two years and I noticed a lot of hair loss and my toes and my fingers would go numb and tingly. So I was just wondering if I should go vegetarian again based of off what she said or if I should not. And I mean, if I went vegetarian, I would supplement because obviously I had some deficiencies, but I don't know. I just wanted to see what you guys had to say about what she was saying and communicating. Caitlin, Your professor's an idiot. You oh, can tell I her I said that. I was just going to oh, ask her if she wanted us to be PC or no. Not. It's <laughs> too late. You can, too late. She can share this clip. Vegan with her. propaganda film is it, what that was. It's literally, you're, you're, I mean, this is just 100%, Caitlin. Your professor is uh, an idiot. It, it, when it comes to nutrition, uh, is a uh, this is the fact that she would even show propaganda. the fact that she would even show that documentary of all documentaries to show in a class is just <laughs> yeah. let me let, super biased. Let me let me guess. She's a vegan. No, she actually isn't. And I mean, I've talked to other people, and they've talked to her about it, and she still eats meat, but she just I guess she doesn't let eat it as much. I don't really know. No. I so I got, if you get time, Caitlin, uh, look up Lane Lane Norton review on the Game Changers. He did a complete science breakdown on every point that entire document and like wrote it all out in a nice like uh, ebook. Print that shit off and give that to her. Look, here, okay. drop it on her desk on your way out of class he, he, next week. Here's the deal. Okay, the data is clear on this. Okay, if you compare a well organized vegan diet to the standard typical American diet, it will outperform the standard American diet. If you compare any diet that's well-planned to the standard American diet, it will outperform. The problem is, is they're not comparing apples to apples, okay? A healthy omnivore diet is superior to a healthy vegan diet. And I'm speaking generally because there are always exceptions. There are some people out there who for whatever reason have immune responses to meat, just like there's some people out there that have immune re responses to plants. And those are very, very rare exceptions in which and where they need to actually eat kind of these extreme diets. But our body, we evolved to eat a wide variety of foods. And, and again, this is not ideal. So I'm not going to tell you that this is ideal, but this does give us a clue in terms of how important meat is. If you had to pick one food to eat forever, if you were on an island and you could only take one food yeah. and you had to live there for two years yeah. and not die, there's only one food that would sustain you and you would not uh, uh, create a nutrition defi nutrient deficiency, and that would be fresh meat. There isn't a single plant that could do that. That's a really hard thing to refute. Yeah. M meat is extremely nutrient dense. The reason why you lost hair and you had you know tingling in your fingertips and probably hormone imbalances was because there are certain nutrients that are either not found in plants or terribly absorbed in plants. For example, the vitamin D that you may get in some plants, very, very difficult to absorb and use in comparison to the vitamin D that you may find uh, in animal. Same thing with B vitamins, same thing with iron. So I am not saying that you should just eat meat, but I am saying that an omnivore, well-planned well omnivore diet you're, you're going to do very well. By the way, studies also show that vegans are 
have a higher rate of mental illness and have higher rates of nutrient deficiencies. Nutrient deficiencies among vegans is uh, quite high because of precisely what I'm saying. Now, you can eat a very well-planned vegan diet and supplement and probably be okay, but it's going to require a lot more planning and the odds that you can do it without supplementing are far lower than if you did if you ate an omnivore diet. So what's the ideal diet? Well, this can vary from person to person, but it probably includes both plants and animals. Okay. Probably that's, it's like that for most people. So this really makes me upset that a, that a professor yeah, yeah. would say something like this uh, and, and make Super someone misleading. like, and what makes me even more upset because you're a, you're a college student. So you're supposed to listen to your professors and here you are hearing your professor say something to you that made your health go, go bad. And now you're questioning, should I go back to doing that? I'm going to give you a piece of advice that I think this is as a father that I think will, will benefit you for the rest of your life, especially as a female, especially going through the medical system. Cause there's gonna be times you're gonna have to go to the doctor and do stuff. Listen to your body before you listen to anybody else. Cause you are going to encounter doctors as well. who are going to tell you that you're losing your mind. No, you're not. Let's just take this antidepressant. Oh, it's not your hormones. Bullshit. If your body is telling you something's wrong, then something is wrong. And I don't care who is on the other end telling you that, uh, that that's not true. So if this professor is like, no, vegan's great. And you're like, my hair's falling out. Don't listen to the professor. Obviously, something was off with your diet. Yeah, I just I just Googled this to make sure it's this easy to find. Put in Lane Norton. Actually, we'll just send it to her. Lane Norton uh, Game Changers. And the first thing that pops up is his full review and breakdown and it, like and refutes every point they make with scientific studies to blow that stupid documentary yeah. out of the water here's and here now here's the big the, the here's the big big problem or challenge with the vegan uh, movement unlike other diets the vegan diet there's a core group of people who believe it to be moral so this is different than any other diet right you keto paleo Mediterranean, carnivore, bodybuilding, I don't care. Every diet, the main core principle behind it is it'll make you stronger, faster, healthier, leaner, whatever. The vegan diet has a core group of people behind it who believe in the morality of the diet. So let's just imagine people were eating kids and we and kids made you healthier. We would still be like, no, we need to come out with every piece of information to tell people not to eat kids, even if it made you healthier, because those poor kids, we can't be eating kids. This is how these core group of vegans believe about their diet. So to them, to hell with the science, they're going to take all the data they can and twist it and promote it in a way to just get people to stop eating animals. And yes, so what? Some people will be less healthy, but we need to save all the animals. So the propaganda behind the vegan movement is the worst that I've ever seen in my entire life precisely because of that. And if you look at the people that put together game changers, that's what you have. You have some very militant vegans who are like, they will at, 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 for any cost prevent people from eating animals. So it, and Lane, is a, he's a PhD, he's a doctor in this field. He's not a kinesiologist, he's an actual nutritionist. He'll go, he goes through and breaks it all down so you can see for yourself. But no, don't listen to them. Um, eat both. And if you want more advice, I would say aim for about a gram of protein per pound of body weight for performance, muscle, strength, uh, insulin sensitivity, uh, and health. Those That would be the other piece of advice that I would give you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I have been doing that all of this time, aiming for a gram per pound and everything. So thank you for that. I feel like I've gotten a lot of strength gains. So that's why I was confused about why she was saying that. And I had, um, my boyfriend took the class before, um, the semester before, and he was really angry that she was saying all these things. And it made me angry whenever she said those things to him and like his class. But then whenever I was in it, it just seemed so convincing. So yeah. I got really, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Listen oh. to your body, Caitlin. Yeah. Don't let anybody ever tell you that your body is lying to you. If your hair is falling out and you feel like shit, I don't care what they what they say on the other hand. There's something wrong, right? So listen to your body. Yeah, Caitlin. I'm gonna I'm gonna have Doug put you in our private forum too. So just in case this teacher says any other dumb shit, you can run it by us. Oh my gosh! Yay! Yeah. <laughs> she probably will. Yeah. Oh, that'd be awesome <laughs> yeah. if they saw yeah. this and, yeah. they, and they want to debate or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'd be awesome.
I doubt it. Thank you. You got it. Thank All you. Right. I Ooh, really that, trigger, that triggers something in me. Yeah, always. you know what it was? Yeah, it's a professor, bro. Well, and the fact well, that you... she had clear signs that uh, you know her body was was not doing well. What makes me mad is this: is look, there's many way, there's many diets, and you can eat them in in healthy ways. There are ways to eat vegan diets yeah. in ways that are healthy. It just takes more planning. We've said that many times. I'm not anti-vegan. Here's what really pisses me off: we have a kid. Okay, she's young, and her a a, a superior, someone that she's supposed to trust. Mm -hmm. Is giving her advice that potentially could harm her health. It already did. Yeah. So it's like, screw you. Like, what are you trying to do here by by you know putting this crappy message out there um, and potentially hurting me? Just like I would never say that vegan is bad for everybody because there right. may there are some people out there that that does work best for them and it's and it is healthiest for them. So um, yeah, that makes me super upset. I really really hope that she takes that and prints it off and leaves it on her her desk like literally just oh that oh Lane even if even if yeah. she doesn't want to be uh confrontational herself and just anonymously yeah anonymously <laughs> i read this print that don't even tell, say anything just leave it on her desk highlight the title yeah. of it drop it on her desk when she's not looking and yeah. leave because little, I mean, little messages about who knows how many other people you could save that this teacher I, stops promoting some bullshit and, like and that. i'm gonna say this again of like all the documentaries uh, you know Jesus what Christ. typically motivates bad information in the market is money, right? Mm -hmm. What makes you the most money? There's only one thing worse than that, and that's false virtue. And when you when you believe, and I get this, look, I, I respect you. If you think eating animals uh, is is immoral, and we should never eat animals, like I respect. And if you live that way, like I respect you because you actually your actions uh, support your beliefs. I respect that, but I I will not listen to you because you're so driven by this morality that you have that you're going to say anything to get me to, to listen to you and to believe you. Anything. And it's even worse than people motivated by money because you don't care if you lose money. You don't care about what I, you yeah. just don't care. You just want it, people to not eat animals. It's a righteous pursuit and, now. And it's a terrible, and it, it, has, it hurts a lot of people. So look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me on Instagram at Mind Pump Stefano. And you can find Adam on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the yeah. It was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 